The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Welcome to Compass. This week, a look at how politics has changed in Minnesota. When Republicans Were Progressive is a new book that looks at how the state's political climate has changed over the past few decades. The book's authors know that history well from their experiences and join us now in studio. Senator Dave Durenberger was in the U.S. Senate from Minnesota from 1978 to 1995, being the only Republican senator from Minnesota elected to that post three times. Laurie Sturdivant has served as an editorial writer and columnist for the Star Tribune and has written several books on Minnesota history, and here they are. Thank you to both for coming in. It's, it, it, it's, this book is a treat. I, I have to admit, if someone hasn't seen it yet, I love the book. Uh, it was just great fun to read, and I want to appreciate that both of you put this together. Um, and, and Senator Durenberger, I, I know that um, you had said in the book that what, what inspired you to write this in part was a discussion you had with the former director of the Minnesota yeah, Historical Fridley. Society, Russ Fridley. Tell me about that. It was just shortly before his death in 2010, and uh, Russ invited me to breakfast downtown St. Paul. And <clears throat> the purpose was, as he got to right off the bat, that um, I was needed to write. I needed to write a book about the history of Republicans in Minnesota. And in 2010, this is like a year after the Republicans in Washington have pledged to make. Obama a one-term president, and to do it at the price of the Affordable Care Act, which is something I had worked on for a long time, <laughs> and even right up until 2009 in helping people get ready for the politics of it. But nobody anticipated that. And when that happened, um, it was like I looked at my buddy and I said, why in the heck would I do that? <laughs> you know, right about Republicans in Minnesota. And he said, because you've known the kind of Republicans that I will, you should write about. And he called them progressive Republicans from Harold Stassen to my time. And, and um, I said, fine, <laughs> you know, and then never gave it another thought until a number of years later sure. when I decided, yeah, you know, there is, it is possible that we can change. Yeah. Well, and, and to give our viewers in a sense of the change, I know Lori, in your book, you had just, in the book you described this as saying that it, this may be the biggest story, I quote, biggest story I've covered during more than 40 years as a journalist, the change in the Republican Party. Well, I think so, Les. My, my focus has always been on Minnesota politics and especially the Minnesota legislature. And so I've watched a transformation in the thinking of the Republican Party up close from that state vantage. Uh, it, and it's just a dramatic change. Some of the things that were uh, the, the, the prize actions, the, the, the pride of the Republican Party in the late 1960s, which is the period we describe as the heyday of Minnesota's progressive Republican wing, those are the very things now that today's Republican Party opposes. So huge changes. And, and of course, mm -hmm. the, we can mention names that to some people are very familiar and others may not be. Harold Stassen, mm -hmm. uh, an important part in the book in the early part to describing the, the Stassen era, and Elmer L. Anderson. And um, I know because both of you worked so closely with Elmer and he is so remembered so fondly. I know you both talk about him in this book. So I'd like to start with him and tell us about the influence of Elmer L. Anderson f for both of you. Dave? Sure. Um, I was... Um, I got to know Elmer best when Harold Vander, my law partner, asked me to join him when he was elected governor. And I was to be his executive secretary, as they called it, like chief of staff sort of thing. And um, um, two things that I, that I stand out in my mind about that was the legislative leaders and the Republicans dominated, the conser they were conser called conservatives, and they, they dominated the Senate and the House that year. And when he got elected, he asked the leadership of the, of the legislature what, or they came to see him and asked him, what should we do? And he said, pass the party platform. 
And basically, we did pass the two thirds of the party platform, but it was the nation's first, you know, Department of Human Rights, a pollution control agency, a Department of Labor and Industry, uh, the Metropolitan Council, Metropolitan Sewage, Metropolitan Transportation. A lot of these things, uh, the state college system really got developed in that period of time. And this was all Republicans, but it was passed with Democrats because that's the way progressive Republicans do business, you know, do the, do the people's business in that period of time. But the other thing I remember that applies to Elmer, of course, is that um, Elmer knew that Harold Levander wasn't necessarily prepared to be governor. And it wouldn't hurt if occasionally when he could sense from the news that Harold was having some difficulty, he would drop in, you know, and he'd come into my office and he'd say, do you suppose uh, you could find a few minutes for the governor, you know? And so that's how we really got, that's really how we got to know each other. And subsequent to that, when Harold decided to serve only one term, uh, Elmer came to me and said, uh, Dave, you don't need a job after this. Um, um, you need a purpose, yeah. the way he put it. And he That's offered true. me a job at H.B. Fuller Company that came with purpose. And of course, for his entire life, he was always coming up with ideas and calling people, as you said, was Harold yeah. Levander or, or somebody else with suggestions. And Lori, I know you worked with him on books at the end of his life as well. Well, that's right. So he was always making news. I yeah. started covering state politics in 1978 and very soon thereafter got to know Elmer. I think knowing Elmer, he, he took me out to breakfast, as I recall, at the Minneapolis Club because that was his way. He, When he somebody popped into his radar as worth knowing, he would make an initiative to uh, break a little bread and, and get to know each other. So he and I did some, a fair amount of business along the, the way, but then in 1998, he decided it was time to do a memoir. He'd been urged to do so many times, but unfortunately by that time he was also blind, or very nearly so, and so he needed help. And I was willing to try my hand at ghostwriting. And so we produced a book called A Man's Reach, which was published by University of Minnesota Press in, in 2000. And then a second volume called I Trust to Be Believed, which was a collection of new and old speeches with some fresh commentary that was published in 2004, the year he died. Yeah, which, which I've also seen, and for people who would really appreciate when Republicans were progressive, those books were a great look at, at Minnesota history and, and the history of a great public servant, Nell Morrell. Um, and as we look at, El Morel and his legacy, and we look at the changes in political parties, there was a, a line I, I found in the introduction um, that I thought really describes some of this well, uh, where it said that no one would claim today that Minnesota has two philosophically centrist political parties, one slightly left or one slightly right. America's political middle no longer has a party. So I'm just wondering, how did we as a state or society get to this point? Um. Slowly, but for people like Lori, obviously, and for those of us on the inside we've, who bore the brunt of it, you know, we got it too. But I, I'm not sure that the, the public was quite aware of what was happening, but I sensed it almost after I got to the Senate that while, um, like President Reagan and his vice president, who became president, H, President George H.W. Bush, uh, both turned out to be, um, while they were conservative, they really turned out to be the kind of people that found themselves most comfortable somewhere on the right side of center. And um, Reagan, for example, when, when he couldn't get one of his more conservative ideas through a more bipartisan Senate, would tell Howard Baker, who was our leader, or Bob Dole, who succeeded Howard, he'd say, hey, don't worry, you know, we're batting 72%, that's not half bad. <laughs> he was just that kind of a person with a, with a personality that didn't let the, maybe the inability of others to see some of the things that he thought he could see, but the fact that he could, he could see that the momentum in public policy, momentum in international relations, in national security policy, was what this was all about in the, in the period of his presidency. Was a, was a huge gift. Um, and he came to look like, if you looked at his legislative record, if you looked at his national security record, he looks like one of those centrists too, even though he may have been coming from a little farther right than the rest of us. In that setting, in that place, in that office, at that time, 
you know, he found that center of America between Republicans and Democrats and our feelings, our philosophies and all the rest of that sort of thing. And uh, it was only after he and then George Bush left office that you could really feel the effect, particularly of Southerners, the people that opposed making it easier to vote for certain people, um, people who saw everything through a strict kind of a conservative sense, uh, who took advantage of Roe v. Wade and its implications, who took advantage of the no new taxes movement and its implications, who took advantage of the National Rifle Association and, you know, but this limited scope of what is a Republican, their goal was to slim that down as much as possible. But the other goal was um, to control the agenda. So whether it was those single issues or it was the preference issues of a much more conservative Republican Party, they could dictate the agenda because they stayed in the majority. And the way, starting in 1995, that they stayed in the majority, but you probably remember the contract for America that, that helped elect people in 1995. They started out making, to make Bill Clinton the one-term president. They opposed what his wife was doing on health care. And so that sort of thing. Then came the contract with America. They got elected. And the first thing they did was break one of the most important connections between 100 United States senators who come from 50 different states. And that is our personal relations and the relations that we had as fathers, husbands, you know, family people in our families with each other. Because he told them, leave your families at home. Don't bring them to Washington. I took four kids to Washington who were like, the youngest was in junior high school and the oldest was, 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 a, was a junior in, excuse me, he was a, in junior high sure. and, the, and the oldest was a, was a junior in high school. Um, but we all got to know each other well. He ended that, told them to leave their families at home and he would guarantee them they wouldn't have to work more than two nights a week maybe three weeks out of, the, out of a month, and uh, say eight or nine months out of the year. And that's what broke this sense of we're all in this together, sure. whether you're from the South, the North, the East, the West, the big cities, yeah. or, something, or rural yeah. America. Sure. And that, they broke that, and we've been living with that ever since. And of course, Laura, you would have been seeing this more from a state perspective, covering state politics starting in the 1970s. So your perspective was seeing this same sort of thing play out on the Minnesota level? No, the Minnesota legislature certainly became markedly more partisan during these same years. It, it, it was a place without party designation for about 50 or 60 years. That came back in 1973. And in the years, each year subsequently, it seemed that the, the partisan hostilities became greater. But let me just try to summarize what uh, all, the, all the forces that Dave mentioned are certainly true. All those uh, various forces and, and, and uh, uh, foes that uh, brought this change about. But what we've been describing as sort of the overarching change is that uh, uh, for, for many years, politics was seen in this country as a means to an end. The end being governance. Mm -hmm. Keeping government running, keeping government functioning in a way that uh, serves people well was the real goal. Something shifted and now politics seems to be the end, not the means. So it seems to matter less in, in among our elected officials how much they actually accomplish in government. It seems to matter more how much money they can raise, how many uh, votes they can amass, how much they can appeal to their bases. And through the kind of campaigning we've been doing, how many people who might otherwise participate are so turned off by politics that they don't vote, they don't contribute, they, they don't want to run for office. That's what we've done to ourselves. And because so much of our audience at Pioneer is, is rural, I'd like to touch on the rural urban issues because I know there was a quote that struck me um, in the book where you say that how this has changed in that years ago, neither party saw an advantage in fanning regional resentments. So I, I thought was, that was a quote that struck me as I, as I read through this. So elaborate a little bit on, on the rural urban dynamic as well, if you well, would, in please. The, the heyday period that we described, this period of, of the late 60s, early 70s, both parties had pretty strong holds in 
all parts of the state. Oh, the Iron Range was pretty heavily DFL, no question about that. But in those years, the metro area was quite competitive. When I first started covering the uh, politics for the uh, Star Tribune, it was the, the Tribune in those days, the Minneapolis City Council had a number of Republican members. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, people, Many people don't know that Republican Governor Arne Carlson started his career as a member of the Minneapolis City Council and served, represented Minneapolis in the legislature for many years. So uh, that, uh, similarly, there were Democrats being elected in much of greater Minnesota. Uh, that was true up until about 10 years ago, actually, when we began to see this sorting out by party of our state. I don't think that's good for Minnesota because our, one of our great strengths as a state has been our willingness, our ability to come together at the state level and make state government the tool by which we, we, we work on education and health care and infrastructure, those big government cost drivers, those big government services on which we all rely. Using state resources, the state powerful state tax engine to, to uh, raise the money and then make those services work well has been really important to the state and that's at risk if we're so regionally divided. Yeah, it is. And I know that, that um, Senator Durenberger, you talked a bit about in the book about how um, there was this balance that in, when you got to the Senate, every state had a voice. And very early on, that was an important concept for you. And it sounds like that same sort of voice, whether it's the individuals or whether it's the, this, every state having a voice, that that's a critical part that, that in some ways we've lost. Mm -hmm. it is, and it, it clearly is. And uh, the, the way we learned, I mean, what, the way we learned about ourselves at the state level was uh, basically, I'll keep it simple, by defining a problem before we started debating its solutions. <laughs> you know? And you get into complicated things like I've got used, gotten used to healthcare. getting into like healthcare and education and, you know, taxes and their implication and international trade and we can go through all the, ag, the various ag policies and, and the, the many other policies that affect agriculture. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's real easy to say, as the current president has been saying, you know, get China or do whatever, you know, and then the consequences are the American soybean farmers, corn farmers are looking for products and things like that. So it's, uh, but the genius of doing it from the center is that you can, you can get to consensus on what the problem is much more easily. And at that point, you start drawing on the resources that put you there sure. in that office. And some of these are rural, some of these are urban. In Minnesota, the, some of the greatest contributors in our legislature, the, the named leaders, come out of rural Minnesota. But they combined through this whole period of time on a way to get a consensus because it was more important to get it right and to get your way accomplished. And the only way to do that is to bring all these people together. This, what the governor now is talking about, one Minnesota, it's just a reality. It's not two Minnesotas. Well, you know, I'm Collegeville, Minnesota, you know, <laughs> the Holy Land up in central Minnesota sort of yeah. thing. You know, we all have, we all have the kind of roots that have, that have grown in a state in which they're the common interest in all of us, to my way of looking at it, is that this state itself is a renewable resource. We, the six million people in this state, are part of those renewable resources. And some of them are expressed as agriculture, or timber, or paper, or a lot of things like that. But they're all expressed in who we get to become in this state. And when you adapt that to politics, it teaches you to find from others how they're thinking about a particular problem and what role government should play in solving it. And especially in the idea that, I know you talked in the book as well about a can-do sort of spirit or the idea that we're, you know, we're from Minnesota and we know how to solve problems and we know how to work together, whether that was the Citizens League for many years or other groups, that there were these informal structures or sometimes formal that would come together in interesting ways to solve problems, generally with people who are working in the middle. That's right and in a bipartisan fashion, which was our tradition. Uh, we, sh we give that up at our peril, I think. It's uh, important for us to, to aggregate our resources in a variety of ways, and that includes 
philosophically and in terms of, of, of party notions, when we aggregate our resources, we're stronger in Minnesota. It's what allowed us to punch above our weight for a long time in this state. Yeah. And I know one of the examples that I read in the book was about the town hall meeting idea mm -hmm. of people coming together. Um, and I, I'm not probably going to describe it very well. So, <laughs> Senator, I'll just, and Lori, I'll just let you talk about that town hall meeting idea as a way to sort of recapture some of the ideas of how we can work together to solve problems. Well, that runs really deep in Minnesota history. You know, this is originally a state founded by New Englanders, and then some of the New England attitudes about the uh, participatory democracy and about community, those were reinforced when Scandinavians and other Northern Europeans came to this country in, in the uh, uh, years after the Civil War. The notion was that citizenship was everybody's responsibility. Uh, we were a little slow to get women to the table, but uh, men, including African-American men, very soon after the Civil War, in 1868, the vote was extended to African-American men in Minnesota. That was before it happened nationwide with the, the constitutional change. So Minnesota believed that everybody should have a role to play. <clears throat> it's why we have such a big legislature. It's why we have such a plethora of local and county governments. 87 counties is a, a large number for the state. But it's because we believe that government should be widely dispersed and that lots of people should participate. It made for a stronger society was the notion. Yeah. And what you said earlier about uh, the Citizens League and so forth, was, it was a source of way of, of looking at a problem and a source of finding solutions that crossed all kinds of political differences. But ultimately, and I mentioned this earlier, they got expressed first at the precinct caucus level. Sure. You go to your precinct caucus on the first whatever it was of <laughs> February or something like that, and you met with people that lived in your geographic area. And you went through this whole list of issues that became the platform of the party. Today, nobody goes. I mean, I shouldn't say nobody goes. The people that go are the single issue people. And, you know, my favorite example is the guy who came back from his home in Arizona or something like that just for his precinct caucus a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody knew him. He didn't seem to know everybody. So they nominated him to be the chair. He, he took the chair, did all the things he's supposed to do. They get the first resolution up, and it was on, the, on Roe v. Wade and the issue of abortion. An hour later, he took his gavel, pounded it on the table, and said, thank you for the honor you do me as your chair, but I have to leave. And he, he walked out of the caucus. That's today compared to the people that created solutions. And we've got about three or four minutes left, and I want to get to the, there's so many things to get to, but the closing chapter of the book, um, an editorial of sorts, it touches on this with a wonderful title, Reviving the Middle. So this is sort of the way forward or the way out. So I'd like to talk about that a bit. Um, because of course, uh, polarization, one of the quotes I think that, that we had in the book was that we are now more polarized than any time since Reconstruction, I think was the phrase you used in the book. So it's clear, moving toward the middle is logical, so I'd like to talk about how we do that. So, Senator? Yes, I think, <clears throat> I think we start where Larry has, Larry has already mm -hmm. positioned us, which is uh, what's the purpose of becoming a candidate and what's the challenge to becoming a candidate and what's the challenge to being a voter, making a decision about a candidate. And as she has already referred to, a whole lot of that <laughs> is is this business of what does it cost to run a campaign? Where does the money come from? And what is the message that the people with the money insist mm -hmm. on you carrying for them to the polls and then to your office? We think that in Minnesota, the mechanisms still exist for a, a, an assertion of more grassroots controlled politics. We haven't changed the laws that permit that. It's democracy is as much a renewable resource yeah. as anything else in Minnesota, that, as Dave mentioned. But we do think that the system needs some revival. And the idea that I think is the most potent and the one we've been talking about with audiences around the state this spring is ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting is in use now in Minneapolis and St. Paul. It's uh, potentially to be used in many more municipalities as sort of a proving ground in the hope that eventually it might go state or even national. It will allow uh, multiple candidates to be on the ballot and uh, voters to, to rank their preferences, one, two, three order. It will allow voters who prefer a candidate who might not appear to be likely to win to indicate a second choice and therefore not worry that they're going to inadvertently help elect the, the least favorite candidate. It asserts majority rule, and I think it also tones down 
the negative campaigning, which has been such a blight in our system. We've got about one minute left, so I just want to close out with some final thoughts on here. Obviously, this book was a long time in the making. You had that conversation with Russell Fridley in 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, and Lori, of course, you, this is your 11th book. What did the two of you hope people take away from reading this book? That this is prologue to the future. This is who we are. This, you know, this is, this is us. We can take this thing back, and we will. I hope people realize that it wasn't so long ago that our politics was different. And these are human systems. Human beings can change them. They, our system is dynamic enough. More change can be coming, and people can be in charge of that change. Okay. Great thought to end on. I wish we had more time, because I, um, I loved reading the book, and it's been, just been great fun having you both here. But I want to thank you both for being here, Senator Dave Durenberger and author Laurie Sturdivant. Thank you much for joining us on Compass. Thanks for having us. The book is When Republicans Were Progressive, published by Minnesota Historical Society Press. That's all the time we have for this episode of Compass. Thanks for watching and see you next week. Do you have an idea for Compass? Send your suggestions and comments to your TV at pioneer.org. Does your company want to make a difference in your community? Reach your neighbors in the upper Midwest and beyond while helping your bottom line by supporting Pioneer Public Television. Our goal is to educate and enrich all those who call this region home. To learn more about sponsorship opportunities, visit pioneer.org or contact your TV at pioneer.org.